by the cost of freedom buried in the ground Mother Earth she will swallow you lay your body down Mother Earth, she was swallowed. Labor and the Expression of Worth, Cautionary Tales. Reckon I can wait another hour. Reckon we all gotta wait a while. A lot of my online work that you see is my effort to free myself from my own limiting stories. If I can tell the story enough times, maybe I can be free from the story. It's just a story, right? By telling the story, my hope is for self-liberation. By telling the story, I hope to share with my children and others like me the insight that I have gained from all of this. By telling the story, I remind myself of where I came from. This is an act of self-compassion, an act of education, an act of disidentifying with all the neurotic dysfunction that has defined so much of my life. When I can describe something, it means that I understand it. When I understand something, I am less likely to be scared of it. If I can teach it, then maybe I can learn more about it. I know what it is like to desperately give myself away in search of love. I discovered this thing in myself that I once called love. That thing I uncovered was shame. Turns out, some of us were given shame in place of love but we weren't told that it was shame. We were told that it was love. That's foundational. When we are closely identified with shame, we search desperately for this thing we call love, but desperate searches for love can only manifest more shame. Shame begets shame. Bloodlines. Henry David Thoreau said that there is no wisdom in desperation. Why do we stay in circumstances and in relationships that hurt us? Why do we allow ourselves to be so hurt? Why do we take all this so personally? How can we escape these invisible prisons, this bondage to sickness and pain that we put ourselves in? We lie to one another, not because we are trying to be deceptive. Most of the lies we tell are unconscious. We lie to one another unconsciously especially those of us who are foundationally devoted to this identity based in shame. What is it in our current paradigm that blinds us from seeing past our self-deception? We've all heard the stories of physically abused spouses who stay with their partners for years. We have heard of hostages taken who bond with their captors. When I was 35 years old, I went to a therapist. I had a violent outburst at home that made me realize that all my efforts to contain my own hurt within myself had failed. In other words, I saw my shame as it was expressing itself in my own nuclear family. I had found myself a half step away from a domestic call. That is how it would have been classified on a police report. I caught it. With some help, I caught it but not before it scared the shit out of my entire family who had managed to gather behind a locked door which I was just about to start banging on. That night became a reference point for my family. There was a public repentance that took place in me, and that's when I went to my first therapist. It was in that room that I eventually started to cry. I cried until I could no longer take a breath as if I had hit a wall and I was frozen in time. Breathe, Penny would say, and I would. Penny asked me one day, how much of the talk in your head is that angry father? 85%, I nearly blurted out after just a short consideration. So I asked for another moment to consider. After a look inward, I confirmed. 85%, I said again. Travis, Penny said, have you ever heard of Andy Dufresne? Yes, I said, Shawshank Redemption. Then Penny said something to me that I may never forget. 
She said, Andy Dufresne, the man who crawled through a tunnel of shit and came out clean on the other side. Start crawling, Travis. This is not going to be easy. Little did I know how many times over the next 13 years that I would think I had finally emerged, arms outstretched upward toward the cleansing rain, just like Andy Dufresne. Just like he freed himself through the intestinal system of that terrifying institution named Shawshank. The crawl through the tunnel was the climax to years of preparation that Andy had done. He had to make the break. He had to have the hope for freedom. Nearly five years ago, I made a break from a marriage relationship that, despite two years of marriage counseling and some level of devotion to the healing process from both my ex-wife and I, we could not set it right. For five years, I have been trying to put some kind of authentic life together, but it seems that every step leads me back to my own neurosis. Because my ex-wife was repelled from the physical nature of the masculine, we had struggled with our sex life. I hoped all I really needed was to be with the heterosexual woman who truly wanted me. It's understandable that I would think that, after being married to a woman for 20 years who was frightened by my maleness. Nearly two years ago, I got married again. Turned out to be more of the same. Turns out I finally saw how I was searching for shame. I was literally asking for it. I saw myself giving away my power. I saw this very pitiful and sick man who was giving up his power over and over again as he tried to realize some romantic fantasy. It turns out that a lot of people knew this about me already. Some of them had tried to tell me, but I couldn't hear, and here's why. I believed that sacrificing myself for a woman was love. I was told to love my wife like Jesus loved the church, well, Jesus hung on a cross for the church. Isn't that how the story goes? But the sacrifice that I made was unholy. My masculinity scared my wife. In her defense, my expression of masculinity was surely not one of health. My first wife. We, we've got a wife who is afraid of the masculine because that is who violated her as a child. And then we've got a husband who has no true expression of the masculine because it was never taught to him or he wasn't able to receive it. A combination of both, I'm sure. So the husband gives up the steering wheel completely because he can't stand up against his wife's disappointment when he takes a wrong turn. A husband who is desperately trying to love his wife by softening all his masculine edges. A husband who does not know how to say no, does not know how to disappoint. A husband who is constantly close listening to his wife's emotions, constantly trying to hear her, only to be told over and over that he never listens. I become this twisted, sad, jealous expression, practicing non-aggression and self-compassion, trying to become this good husband, still trying to escape the violence of it all. I say that because that's how I felt it. It felt violent to me. It was a long and painful process, and the more work that we did on ourselves, the further we seemed to drift apart. How is it that two people could try so honestly and hurt each other that deeply? The truth is, is that in the midst of all of that, it wasn't all terrible. There was a, a lot of love. We had enough love to hold it together so our children would have a safer place than both of us had growing up, and that's a good thing. We had a family and many people in a town who gave us love and attention that we really needed. The sage is on the windowsill and the rolls are in the oven. Snow is dripping from the roof and most of the pies are pumpkin. All the family's smiling as I look around the room. And the mud I dragged in earlier needs attention from Betty's broom. All the dust from all the shoes From all the folks they ever knew Has been swept up by the bristles On the end of Betty's broom It appears to me there'll always be Room for one more chair 
But the graspers and the dust bunnies and Sandy's golden hair must be swept up before company gets there with Betty's broom. Coyotes calling across the sand hills, sun is setting soon. Jack's old house is barely standing, owls perched in his room. Campfire songs in summertime while we hum a happy tune. Come walk among the shinneries, dear Liza's harvest moon. Make sure you bring your singing voice and a pair of walking shoes. Tracking all your memories will sweep up the front room with Betty's broom. Now we must be leaving, but we know we'll be. Kids, in ten minutes, we'll be leaving, but we know we'll be back. Now we must be leaving, but you